Raptor could hear his team speaking from inside the briefing room. Their voices a low and familiar buzz that should have been comforting after so long away. Instead, it made him feel... Blink. Numb. In a way. He had spent months recovering to experience this very moment. And now that it had arrived, he found that the reality of it was nothing like the anticipation. Or maybe it was more honest to say that he wasn't the same, and his anticipation had been based on the man he was before the radiation poisoning. There had been days upon days where he wondered if the polonium had rotted parts of his brain away, and he was just running on the scant remainder. But all the doctors assured him that his mind was intact. It was his body that was different but he didn't mind all that much. After being so violently confronted with the frailty of his physical self, Raptor was glad to be changed, stronger, more resilient. The next time, he wouldn't fail. He wouldn't fall. He just wished that brought him some sort of joy to know. Joy had disappeared with weakness, though. Maybe the fragility of life was why those little glimmers of pleasure meant as much as they did. He set his jaw and inhaled deeply through his nose. They had saved him to be a machine. A warrior. Maybe if he had realized that before the seed vault, he wouldn't have found himself in the position that he was. When he was dying, he was blindly furiously glad that he had sacrificed himself for Aegis. She was a life giver, and he was just a killer, wasn't he? But as he healed, that pride in saving his teammate had bled away, leaving questions in his mind that he hated. Was she really worth more than him? Or should he have preserved his own life first? None of the Umbral Doctors ever told him that outright, but they made it clear that now he was worth more than anyone else in the Eclipse Initiative, and there were to be no more damn heroics on his end. They were vague, their answers shadowy, except for Howard. He gave Raptor a little more than the others possibly owing to his existing relationship with the team, or his disillusionment with Umbral. You are the golden child right now, Howard told him at nearly a whisper, carefully inserting a hyper-sharp needle in Raptor's enhanced skin to take blood. They'd nuke the entire team just to save you. Keep that in mind while you're out there. You are no longer expendable to them, even though they will never tell you that. So, what exactly are you telling me? Howard looked up at him with his single eye. Because you and I have more in common than you might think. And no, I won't elaborate. The exobiologist annoyed the hell out of Raptor but he appreciated the seeds of truth that he offered. But that time was over. Recovery was over. It was time to take his place back with Ares and figure out if he still fit or if the changes he had endured had altered him too much. He experienced things differently now. Raptor saw the micro-scratches on the metal door and heard the clicking of the mechanisms inside the doorknob as he turned it to enter the briefing room. For a portion of a second, he could feel all of his teammates' heartbeats thrumming through the air, and hear the rushing of their blood in the veins before his brain tuned it all out into background noise. The moment was so quick that it was over before any of them even turned to look at him. Sentinel was the first on his feet, 
striding over and shaking Raptor's hand without a moment of hesitation, pulling him in and slapping him on the shoulder emphatically. Welcome back, soldier. It threw him off for a moment. How long had it been since anyone had touched him besides to experiment on him? But he knew how he would have reacted before the poisoning, before the change. And he was able to easily put on the act, returning the half-embrace with a false smile plastered on his face. Glad to be back, sir. Then the rest of the team was there. Jester with a full-on hug. Tempest and Hawkeye with stilted handshakes. And then there was Aegis. He allowed, for a moment, the hyper-awareness to come back to him as he looked at her. Raptor had wondered how exactly he would feel seeing the medic again, and had expected to experience... something big. She was objectively pretty. The hard edges of her cheekbones softened by the fall of blonde hair that she hadn't braided to hide beneath her helmet just yet. He could hear the sharp intake of her breath as she was able to really look at him again, and the way her pupils were wide and black with adrenaline. This is the woman he had traded his old life, his old body for, without a second of hesitation. But when he faced Aegis again, without the barrier of the quarantine room walls, he felt nothing. She was just another soldier. Why in the hell had he gone through all of that, that death and rebirth, for her? It wouldn't happen again. Umbral had saved him. Aegis had doomed him. But he didn't hate her either. It was just nothing. Nothing. Raptor? Aegis said simply, her tone controlled and even, like she had been practicing for this moment. We're also glad you're back. Yeah, thanks. He turned to look at Sentinel, ignoring how the entire team was still and brittle, waiting to see how things had changed with him. Have I missed the briefing? No, the commander said. Take a seat. I was just getting into it. He picked up the paper-thin tablet he had been holding before, pressing a few things on the screen until a projection of a low, wide building filled the space in the air above them. We're heading to Russia for this one. The objective is to retrieve a new technology that Volga has created called Project Genesis. Umbral wants it, so we provide it. This is the base we'll be infiltrating and we have reason to believe the super-soldiers we faced in Svalbard may have also originated here, and may be guarding the place. So pay close attention." Raptor settled in his seat, crossed his arms, and leaned back to listen. He ignored the way every other team member looked over at him multiple times, their gazes heavy. No one mentioned the parallels between Raptor's last mission and his returning one. One of Umbral's rival megacorporations, Volga, had a secret base in Franz Josef Land, Russia. And that was their destination. He knew that it was frigid and desolate, and that the enemies he might be facing were the same ones that took him down last time. But Raptor felt so far removed from the man that he once was that none of it really bothered him. It felt good to have his kit on again, though. To feel useful and confident in what he was supposed to be doing. It was a straightforward mission. Infiltrate, eliminate obstacles, and retrieve this mysterious Project Genesis. Umbral being vague wasn't anything new, but at least he felt a little more prepared than last time. No surprise of cybernetically enhanced soldiers. He knows for a fact that they are there. Surrounded by towering glaciers, the secret base is tucked into the cliffside. The exterior painted in all shades of white, gray, green, and brown to blend into the surroundings. 
It's low profile, one level with just two basement levels past that. The buildings are constructed with cutting edge materials designed to withstand the extreme cold and harsh weather conditions of the Arctic. Snowdrifts cling to the sides, giving the illusion of natural formations rather than man-made structures. It's all within the scope of dozens of other missions he's been on. But the part that Raptor was dreading was how exactly they were getting inside. For this mission, they had to parachute in, the umbral stealth plane able to slip into their airspace without detection, which is going to be miserable. But it isn't the odd part. Their orders are oddly specific about extraction, and have provided multiple means to do so. While Ares was going in quietly, it seemed that Umbral had no issue with offering firepower to pull them out when Project Genesis had been retrieved. Ten minutes out, Sentinel informs them, pulling the Gore-Tex mask over his face and indicating for the rest of the team to do the same. They took turns checking each other's wrists, ankles, and necklines to make sure everything was as sealed as possible. Hypothermia was a possibility, and that possibility was multiplied exponentially with them having to jump. Ares equipped their chutes, and the door to the near silent plane was opened, and the gray-white sky was revealed to them a breath before the cold hit. Raptor could only feel it creeping in through the eye slits in his mask, but it was terrible. The team secured their weapons, lining up, and one by one fell from the plane into the open air. Raptor went second, following Sentinel, gritting his teeth against the dump of adrenaline into his system, and the way Freefall made his stomach feel like it was flipping inside out. Wind pulled at him everywhere, his gear his extended arms, and legs, trying to rip everything from him. He was always shocked about how loud the otherwise quiet air was, the roaring of gravity pulling him back to the earth. He hated it, but he had to admit it was the first time that he had really felt alive in months. The gray of Sentinel's parachute opened below him, and Raptor counted down in his head, his hand finding the ripcord of his own chute and pulling it hard when his count reached zero. It jerked him hard, making his shoulders ache with the force of it, but finally the fall became afloat, and he descended at an even pace the rest of the way down. Not long after, he dug his heels into the ground, taking the blow of the ground easily and unhooking his chute once he was steady once more. Tempest, Aegis, Hawkeye, and Jester followed next, only Tempest looking a little green in the gills. The landscape was rocky, covered in green-yellow lichen, the glacial cliffside close enough to see from their landing point. Time was of the essence if they were going to take the Volga scientists and soldiers off guard. The less time they had to trek across the barren landscape, the better. It was midday, but the winter sun washed everything out. Sentinel motioned them all forward when he was sure that they made it down in one piece, and they began the short hike to the Volga base. It was easy, instinctual even, to rest his hands on his rifle and follow behind his commander. He listened to the quiet chatter between the rest of Ares over the comms, but didn't insert himself. Raptor just didn't have anything to say. It felt surreal to follow Raptor as they hiked the short distance to the outpost, but Jester wasn't complaining. Everything had been weird as fuck without him around. No amount of now-dead deep-water specialists or bitchy biologists could fill his shoes. Of course, they were still missing one team member who was never coming back. But it had been months, and Cypher's death was a numb place in Jester's brain at that point. Grief had no place in a job like this. He had just hoped that having Sentinel Jr. back would help mellow out some of the larger tempers in the group. 
There was a garage door near the south portion of the building. It's still hooked up to security systems, but it shouldn't be nearly as tight as the security at the front entrance. We'll have Hawkeye try to break into the system, but if that doesn't work, Jester will get us in. The commander's voice crackled over the comms. He had to give it to Volga. The hidden base was the best he had ever seen, camouflage-wise. Jester knew what he was looking for, and even then it took a considerable amount of visual searching to determine where the terrain ended and the base began. He knew there would be two types of people within, scientists and cyber soldiers. Thus, the entirety of Ares was armed to the teeth, and beneath their dusty-colored winter kits, all of them were covered in lightweight, fibrous body armor that was supposed to be able to take the beating of a century without letting anything through. It made him sweat, but he wasn't complaining, considering that Umbral had sent them to yet another fucking North Pole mission. Snow was blowing through the air, sparse amounts, but with wind forceful enough that it obscured their approach well enough. Their kits and gear were all constructed to avoid surveillance, both electronic and visual. But there were still six of them, so they weren't exactly invisible. So Ares had to work fast. They looped around the Volga base at a wide angle, moving against the wall of the glacial cliffside until Sentinel held up his fist into the air to get them to stop. Jester couldn't tell how this wall was different from any of the others. There weren't even any tire tracks. But Sentinel knew what he was doing. Once they were within touching distance of the base, he could finally see the hairline fissure that must be the garage door. The snow would stick in the crack, and the heat from inside the building would melt it. Such a minuscule error in an otherwise perfect facade. The commander pointed to Hawkeye, and the sniper turned electronic specialist moved forward. Jester couldn't see where in the hell Hawkeye was even supposed to start, and discreetly began readying his own gear to get the job done. Better a little loud than not at all. Sentinel's patience was legendary, but no one else's was. Jester watched Raptor, wanting to gauge his reaction to Hawkeye's new specialty. The sniper was serviceable, but they had all been spoiled with Savant's cipher, and it made for some long, awkward moments. Three minutes would be nothing for most code crackers, but Ares had higher expectations. This time, though, it wasn't Hawkeye's fault, at least from what Jester could see. The wall was featureless besides the fissure. Jester froze when Hawkeye knelt, pressing two of his fingers against an area on his gauntlet above his oversized wrist interface, and a small compartment popped open. He felt a chill run up his spine when what looked like a handful of bugs crawled out of the compartment, hitting the rocky ground silently and working themselves into the fissure in the wall. What? Nanobots. Aegis whispered. I'm assuming you didn't attend the optional tech seminar last week? I'm gonna go ahead and assume you already know the answer to that. Jester huffed. But huh. Neat. Hawkeye controlled the nanobots from his wrist interface, without saying a single word as usual. And soon enough they heard the muted click of the garage door mechanisms beginning to work. Security alarms down too? Raptor asked and Hawkeye gave a single nod. For now. There was no blaring sound of an alarm, but as the door slid upwards, they could hear the pounding of footsteps coming from inside. Ares pressed against the walls on the side of the door, three on each side. The first head to peek around the corner was a mechanic, unaltered by the looks of him, and in a lightning-quick movement, Raptor had him in a headlock. One large hand clamped over the mechanic's mouth. Two more followed. Another mechanic, and the first soldier they had seen. Both of them executed rapid fire by Tempest. Once they were down, 
Raptor forced his captor to call in an all-clear on his radio, before unceremoniously strangling the man into unconsciousness and leaving him in the snow. With a quick hand motion, Sentinel moved them inside. The garage was a large concrete room with only a handful of all-terrain vehicles scattered about. The Franz Josef base was clearly one of Volga's lesser-used spaces. That, or it was purpose-built for one specific reason. Jester was banking on the latter. They spread out in a half-moon formation and encountered no resistance as they cleared the garage. It felt like the place was running on a skeleton crew, but the truth was more sinister. The upper level was more than likely a smoke screen for whatever was going on beneath the ground. Not to mention that if the incident at Svalbard was anything to go by, just one of those cybernetic soldiers was worth ten unaltered ones. But he wasn't going to complain about the easy entrance and the odd lack of security features. Jester knew he would just have to deal with the repercussions of it later. They passed into a white-walled hallway, everything sleek, minimalist, and empty. The first sign of inhabitants was the living quarters. They were compact, efficient, and obviously lived in. The overhead lighting was soft white, giving everything a clinical feeling. Jester flexed his hands on his AA-12, rolling his neck and shoulders to try and disperse the tension there. They were going to get taken off guard. He could just feel it. They cleared the rooms in teams of two, and Jester ended up with Raptor. Clear. Hey, what do you think the chances are that they knew we were coming? Jester asked. Doesn't matter. Clear. How doesn't it? We're here now. Let's just get it done. He scowled, clearing the final room before they moved to rejoin the rest of the team. The change in Raptor was subtle. He had always been a man of few words, not to an almost comical level like Hawkeye, but Raptor treated his position as second in command, as something to take seriously. Something was... off. Ares moved into the center atrium of the first floor, spreading out once in the round room to cover all points. The ceiling was gently domed. The doorways that led to the other portions of the base were locked behind biosecurity devices that might prove an issue. He wondered if the unconscious mechanic back in the garage had security clearance. Through the door to the left is a small armory. To the right is marked as laboratories, but so is the first basement floor. The second is just marked Genesis and Classroom. Sentinel informed them. Based on that, Umbral thinks that they might be using this place as some sort of private training facility outside of whatever they're experimenting on. Search this atrium, and then we'll move on. It was sparse. Just some seating and tables. But they combed through it nonetheless. Five minutes had passed when to his left, Tempest inhaled sharply. Did you hear something? No. Jester started, but Raptor interrupted with a simple, Yes, someone is watching. The hairs on the back of Jester's neck rose. He saw the shiver of movement above Tempest before anyone else, like a heat wave rising off hot pavement in the summer. The air rippled, and the longer he looked, the more he could make out the shape of what it was. A person, camouflaged, in the corner of the room, braced impossibly with their hands and feet at angles that should have dislocated the joints. His breath caught, but he knew he couldn't draw attention to what he was seeing. Out of the corner of his eye, he watched the figure shift, undulating as it readjusted. Without moving any other part of his body, Jester let one hand fall from his shotgun, and he slowly signed the signal for thermals, and then surrounded. Ares didn't move or react in any way, 
but they flicked their visors into thermal imaging mode with a discreet tap on their wrist interfaces. As the world went gray, Jester looked up, hating that he was right. Perched, like so many insects on the walls above them, were four human figures, glowing red, holding themselves inhumanly still as they watched Ares from their nearly perfect camouflage. Jester heard a series of muted clicks, and the next moment, the four soldiers rappelled down the wall in a blur, their weapons trained on the team. Tempest was the closest, and Jester watched with morbid fascination as one of the soldiers leaped and kicked her in the chest. It happened so quickly that she was still pivoting when she took the strike, but she absorbed the energy, rolling her body as she was flung backward. Jester fired off a shot, but he was loaded with breaching rounds, and it didn't even slow them down. Pulling out the judge, he took aim and squeezed the trigger. The soldier's body jerked but did not go down. Beside him, Raptor's rifle clicked and cycled, but in the fraction of a second it took to reload, one of the cyber soldiers moved in and struck him in the shoulder with a fist. It didn't shake him like it did Tempest. In fact, Raptor didn't move, absorbing the shock of the hit before striking back with the butt of his rifle. The super soldier stumbled. Sentinel gave the signal for the rapid assault reflex, and Ares shifted into position. It was their six against the cyber soldier's four. One by one, Ares engaged the soldiers. Raptor with his enhanced speed, went for the soldier that he had already hit. Jester ran forward, using his body as a battering ram and slamming into another soldier, throwing him into a nearby table. The table shattered, and Jester heard the clack of weapons as Tempest, Hawkeye, and Aegis joined the fray. Sentinel had taken up a position to the right of the garage door, his weapon leveled and steady as he fired on the remaining soldiers. Sentinel had taken up a position behind an overturned table, his weapon leveled and steady as he fired on the remaining soldiers. One of them had landed near Tempest and had been moving to flank her, but the kick that had sent her flying had apparently dazed her, and she didn't move fast enough. Jester could see the flash of metal before the soldier moved, the knife glinting in the red-tinted light as the soldier drove it toward her. Without thinking, Jester threw himself forward, shoving the soldier off of Tempest and tackling him to the ground. The two of them rolled across the floor, and the soldier punched Jester in the side of the helmet hard enough to leave a bruise, his knife falling from his hand. Jester punched back, his fist connecting with the soldier's face, but the blow didn't seem to have an effect. He reached out to grab Jester's arm, and the team's demolitions expert was yanked to his feet. His helmet was pulled from his head and he felt the back of the soldier's hand strike him hard. Jester's head snapped back, but before the soldier could strike him again, Raptor was there, his rifle clicking as he fired at point-blank range. The cyber soldier's fractal skin cracked, and it took three more shots for one to penetrate. The soldier's body jerked, and he fell. Jester reached up his hand finding the strap of his helmet and pulling it back on his head. They rallied, coming together in the center of the atrium in a tight ring, with just enough space left for each team member to drop into the center if they needed to reload before rejoining. Ares had the upper hand, but the cyber soldiers didn't give an inch. They had clearly been training with their implants for months, possibly years and the fact that they hadn't gone down from any of their hits was worrisome. Jester was able to keep track of their movements, the red of their armor seeming to pulse in time with the pounding of his heart. He had fought many things that were faster, stronger, and more dangerous than he was, but it never really got easier. Raptor was in the center of the ring, and as Jester glanced around, he noticed the second-in-command was not moving, in fact, he was standing, weapon pointed to the ground, just looking at the fight happening around them. Jester's stomach sank, and he felt a chill creep through his spine. 
Raptor? Jester yelled, and the soldier's head snapped up, looking around wildly for a moment before focusing on Jester. What are you doing? Raptor didn't say anything, just held up a hand and continued staring. Staring and staring until suddenly he declared, I've got this. Cover me. He moved against the cyber soldiers, and all at once it was clear to Jester what the difference was. Raptor moved like the enhanced humans, and when he struck, it was with the same sort of blunt, unstoppable force. Umbral had done something to his squad mate, something that made him simply more. More lethal, more vicious, just more. They covered Raptor as he had requested, but it was a little disorienting as he watched Raptor and the cyber soldiers move around each other like predators. He swiftly removed the breech rounds, replacing them with slugs, racking the shotgun and returning to the fight. There was no need for orders. The team fell into a rhythm, and with Raptor picking off two of the three cyber soldiers, it was almost easy. Jester hit the other once, twice, and the power of the slugs took him off his feet, enough for Tempest to get her revenge. With her monomolecular blade, tech that had been stolen from these very soldiers back in Svalbard, she cut the sliver of the exposed throat of the last soldier, watching raptly as they fell. Silence reigned for a moment, and then Sentinel let out one frustrated sigh. <sighs> that was messy. We won't get taken off guard again. Change tactics, Raptor said simply. Less group work. And let me take point. I don't think I need to explain it to you all after that fight. But I'm better suited for this than the rest of you. Sentinel drew himself up to his full height. A rare bolt of anger going through him. We're a team. That's not how this works. If I send you forward, go. But we aren't going to change the way we do things in the middle of a job. Raptor looked like he wanted to argue but stopped himself. Yes, sir. Reloading and straightening his gear, Jester could hear the unsaid things passing between all of them. No one else was talking, but there in the silence, a million things were being spoken. Sentinel didn't buy into things that weren't tangible and rooted in reality but he felt some sort of dark energy thrumming, not just between his group, but from somewhere in this building. Taking out four of the cyber soldiers that had been such a struggle for them on the previous mission should have been triumphant, and in a way it was. They had intel from the first fight as well as the extra information provided to them by Umbral after they autopsied the first batch of cyber soldiers. With that... Ares knew how to fight them, knew that it was going to take more brute force than grace to get the job done. And yeah, he knew logically that Raptor didn't just heal from a lethal dose of radiation. Umbral had to have done something wild to pull him out of that death tailspin. But seeing his old squad mate in action, facing the proof that he was so much different, shook even Sentinel some. Then there was the insubordination, but he'd chalk that one up to Raptor having been gone from the Eclipse Initiative for so long. They tried to use one of the downed soldiers to gain access to the laboratory wing, but when it didn't work, Jester had to breach the door. He went thermal again, instead of explosive. The white-hot breaching torch silent and less combustible than explosive charges but it certainly took longer. Long enough for him to think, and for an uneasiness to settle in. There were a few lab workers huddling against the walls, their heads covered by their hands, once they got inside the lab. There were a few lab workers huddling against the walls, their heads covered by their hands, once they got inside the lab. He motioned Aegis forward, and let her hit all but one of them with trank rounds. 
after they ascertained that none of them were armed. Like before, they put restraints on the remaining scientists and had him wait while they got to work investigating the area. It was everything he would have expected from another Megacorp lab. The walls were lined with machinery and computer terminals, and the main portion of the lab had multiple stations with clear partitions separating each one. When they dug a little deeper, he was surprised to find that they had been working on the camouflage transmitters that the cyber soldiers had been wearing out in the atrium. They were different and more efficient than the energy field variety that Ares had encountered before, but it wasn't anything that they hadn't delivered to Umbral previously. Still, Sentinel would have assumed this was classified stuff, but here it was on the ground floor lab. Either it was amateur hour here at the Volga base, or whatever they were really trying to hide was a big deal. In the labs, the temperature had risen a few dozen degrees, enough for a few of the members to remove their masks to make it more bearable. Is this really it? Jester asked, holding one of the half-finished camo transmitters up to look at it. Can't be. Sentinel took a breath to go over the options before nodding to Tempest. Get what information you can. Tempest was still wearing her mask, and although he couldn't see her face, something about the way she tilted her head made him think she was smiling. Gladly. Tempest jerked the bound scientist from the floor and pivoted to put him in one of the rolling chairs. She had a shorter blade in her hand this time, her regular tactical knife, and spun it idly in her gloved hand as she paced a circle around him. The scientist looked like he might wet himself. No theatrics, Sentinel snapped. Make it quick. Yes, sir, Tempest sighed, coming back around to the front of her prisoner and putting two of her fingers under his chin, tilting his head up so he was looking into the only uncovered part of her her eyes. You heard the boss. Let's hear it, and I'll have my friend over there put you oh so gently to sleep. Otherwise, I'm gonna take what I need, and it won't be nearly so gentle. What? The man gasped. What do you want to know? Two simple things. What is Project Genesis, and where is it? He went pale but the scientist's expression was resigned. Like he already knew why Ares was there. Just kill me then. Tempest didn't react, but Sentinel knew it had to have surprised her as much as it did him. Now, now, do you really get paid enough to die for the cause? You reek of civilian. Just give it up. No one needs to die. The scientist laughed, there was no humor in it. Just do it. If I give you what you want, Volga is going to do worse. She crossed her arms, putting the, her weight on one hip. Listen, you have five seconds to give me something interesting. Or, I'm going to make this hurt. He was breathing like a cornered deer. I, uh... They can't get anyone else to volunteer for the cybernetics program, so that's where I'll go if I say anything. Behind Tempest, Raptor stilled. Go on, she prompted. It's a shit show. Only about half come out still partially sane after the implants, and... I mean, sane is being generous. Some are in constant pain. Others have decreased lifespans... I mean, the program is improving slowly, but like everything in this fucking lab, the advancement comes on the backs of corpses. Hmm. Tempest tapped the blade on her mask where her mouth would be and shrugged. Not good enough. Genesis. Now. Just kill. She reached behind the man and cut his hand restraints with ease. Picking up one of the scientist's hands gently, Tempest held it up to the light and sighed. I already said no. Don't you listen? Jester, 
Can you tie his other hand to the chair? As soon as the demolition expert finished, he moved back and gave Tempest her space. She dug the tip of her blade under the scientist's thumbnail with surgical precision, so smoothly that there was no blood at first. But blood or not, her victim screamed as she wrenched the blade up and the nail slowly lifted from the nail bed, flesh trying to hold on for a fraction of a second before it gave in with an extended, wet snap. He struggled, but Tempest dug her knee into his gut, putting the weight of her body on the man while she used the fingers of her free hand to pull the thumbnail the rest of the way off. She tossed it away, and it landed at Sentinel's feet. Tempest had just started to wiggle the tip of her knife under the nail of the second finger when the scientist gave in with a teary, snotty cry of, Fine, fine, just stop! With a flourish, she sheathed the knife and stood back on her own two feet, crossing her arms. Blood leaked slowly from the abused digit, dripping on the floor as he let the arm hang loose. Tempest waved, indicating for the scientist to talk, and with a shuddering breath he did. I don't have the clearance to get to the basement labs, or to even know what Genesis is, but it's definitely down there. He jerked his head towards the line of unconscious scientists. The woman with the gray hair? She's the lab manager. She has the highest clearance of all of us here in the surface lab. So you don't know anything about it? Tempest asked. I want every little detail, even rumors. He pursed his lips and looked like he might be sick. I don't think it's a weapon in the general sense. I think it's alive? Why? She insisted. And hurry the fuck up. Oh god, um... Sentinel watched the scientist swallow hard. Fine. Fuck. Ah. Uh, once a month... They bring a truck here hauling something huge behind it. It's a machine and it runs all night and is gone by the next morning. It blows this black smoke. Oh God, I'm going to be sick. Tempest raised her hand to slap him, but Aegis pushed her way in and held her canteen out with a quiet command of, Here, drink. <laughs> You're soft, Tempest hissed. You think we'll get quicker answers if he pukes his guts out? Tempest snorted, but waited until the medic had finished pouring water into the scientist's mouth before demanding he continue. Okay, okay. There is this black smoke that comes from it overnight, and no one questions it. But look, I grew up in this small town in Cleveland, and our apartment was cheap, because next door was this funeral home. And the same... Black smoke came from it twice a week. Greasy, foul, and meaty smelling. Oh, hell. Aegis breathed, and silently, Sentinel agreed. I'd bet my life that it's a mobile crematorium. The scientist finished. Whatever they're working on down there is producing a large amount of biological waste. So I think they're creating living things. And disposing of the failures. Tempest didn't look bothered, but he was her commander, and he was familiar with the way she clenched and unclenched her fists to disperse the nervous energy inside of her. Is there anything else? She gritted out. And when the scientist shook his head miserably, Tempest stepped back and let Aegis through once more. The medic put the man out with a quick syringe to the neck, and they drug his unconscious body to join the rest of his co-workers. With some effort, the pride-open eye of the lab manager got the first door to the basement level open, revealing an elevator and a set of stairs to the right of it. Ares took the stairs, rifles primed and in hand, because none of them had any illusions that they weren't going to run into more guards. Sentinel sent the rest of the team ahead on the stairs, beside Raptor, and flipped his comms off, 
turning to his second in command. Before we get into another scrum, do you want to tell me what they've done to you? I need to know the capabilities of my team if I'm going to be efficient. You know that. Raptor paused, but shook his head. I haven't lost my mind. Like the scientist said, if that's what you're thinking. Are you the same as the cyber soldiers? He shook his head again. Similar, but not the same. Umbral went in a different direction with its human enhancement program. I... He looked around to see if any of the other team was in earshot. I can tell you what I know later, but now isn't the time, Sentinel. Don't you think the time would have been before we deployed together for the first time? I'm not supposed to tell you a fucking thing, so why don't you let me decide when the right time to put my neck on the line is? Raptor's voice was a low growl, full of frustration. Sentinel wished he could see the other man's face. You're different, whether you think so or not. I know I am, but I'm mentally intact. Understood. Don't move out of formation again, got it? Raptor's yes sir wasn't as convincing as he'd like it to have been, but when they rejoined the rest of Ares, any personal issues fell away, and they all slipped into their identities as cogs in a single machine. With a flow as smooth as water, they moved into the first floor. It was another lab, but this time with an obvious medical tilt to it. He hadn't had time to really consider what sort of biological monstrosity that Volga could be messing around with. Umbral would never let even a cellular sample of Chimera slip through the cracks, and from what he understood, they had torched the entire rainforest surrounding Viridian Labs to the ground after what Ares had discovered last time they were there. As they moved farther in, they could see the lab was dimly lit by a series of low-hanging, cold-toned LED lights, casting elongated shadows on the sterile white tiles. Along one wall, a row of cryogenic storage units hummed softly, labeled as housing genetic samples, tissue cultures, and specialized equipment. Overhead, a network of suspended power nodes and cables fed energy to the various machines and devices. Ares spread out slowly, Hawkeye settling at one of the terminals and connecting to the system. After a few moments, his stilted voice came over the comms. The surface of the back wall is a holographic illusion. I'm about to drop it. Be on guard. The rest of the team spread out in a line, all of them facing the seemingly plain wall with their rifles raised. Hawkeye dropped the hologram, and as it shimmered out of view, they were faced with three isolation chambers, outfitted like prison cells, with beds, sinks, and toilets. Sentinel gave the hand signal for thermals. The cybernetic soldiers were as still as statues, three of them in each cell, their own rifles pointed towards Ares. In the center cell were five figures huddled on the ground, invisible past the camouflage field of the soldiers. Between one breath and the next, the fight was on. The Volga soldiers didn't even bother with opening the doors, just firing through the glass and into the main portion of the laboratory. It shattered into a million glittering pieces as Ares took cover behind the laboratory stations before returning fire. Try and find the optical camo transmitter, Sentinel called. We're at a disadvantage having to use these thermals. Advancing slowly, with glass crunching beneath their feet, the Volga soldiers moved forward. Hawkeye was the first to take out a transmitter, a two-inch box at the base of each of their spines when one of Jester's slugs made a cyber soldier stumble enough to turn around. Providing cover, Aegis called. She lifted her rifle to the ceiling, firing at the lines leading to the cryo storage in tight bursts of three. Liquid nitrogen hissed from the lines and fogged the air around them. In the brief cover, 
Hawkeye moved around one side of the lab, while Raptor took the other, picking off the camo transmitters as quickly as possible. Done, Raptor announced, and they all flipped their thermals off. Sentinel mentally ran through the best options. Raptor could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Volga cyborgs, and they were killed much easier in close quarters. Tempest could hold her own for a brief time in hand-to-hand, -hand, and with her hyper-sharp blade, she had a good chance of a kill. Jester had a small flamethrower, but the shotgun seemed to get better results. Hawkeye was a crack shot and could take out their joints like they had learned at Svalbard. Now, how to put those pieces together. There are nine Volga cyborgs, and six of them. He never stopped firing while he strategized, and finally Sentinel had it. Five were helmeted, and four were bareheaded, the metal spinal implants visible on the back of their necks. Two varieties, then. The helmeted precision soldiers, faster and better shots. Then, the bare-faced berserkers, stronger and more durable. With as few words as possible, Sentinel commanded his team. He and Aegis would provide cover fire for Raptor, so he could move in and engage the Berserker soldiers in close quarters. Their goal was to keep the others occupied, so Raptor never had more than one cyborg to deal with at a time. Hawkeye and Jester would do the same for Tempest. The precision soldiers were faster, but Hawkeye was an otherworldly shot, and he could hit the weaknesses in their joints better and faster than anyone else. Tempest wasn't to peel off and engage unless the target was actually weakened. She was durable, but not as durable as Raptor. Activating the maneuver with a hand signal, Ares sprung into action, changing from holding fire to the attack. Sentinel got the first stun shot, hitting a line of bare skin between one soldier's glove and sleeve when they moved their hand to reload. It didn't penetrate, but he was sure it had cracked the fractal skin from the way the cyborg winced. Raptor was on him in an instant, while Sentinel and Aegis pivoted to hold the rest of the cyber soldiers off in a hail of gunfire. Raptor seized the man's stunned arm, wrenching it backward until it snapped with an audible crack. He kicked a knee out next, and in a smooth arch, took his tactical knife from his belt and stabbed it into the underside of the cyborg's chin. His skin resisted at first, but began to part in a spiderweb of fissures as Raptor pushed upwards, the muscles in his arms bulging even through his body armor. Finally, the cyborg's skin gave way, and the knife sunk in, through the bones of his jaw and into the brain before Raptor pulled it out. He wiped it on the dead man's chest before falling back to Aegis and Sentinel and awaiting his next chance to strike. Tempest's first kill wasn't nearly as graphic, and he was glad to see that she and Hawkeye worked in perfect sync with each other, despite the obvious tension between the two. When it was life or death, all of that fell away. She was Ares, and so was Hawkeye, and that was all that mattered. She moved in low to the ground, just a heartbeat after Hawkeye hit one of the cyber soldiers in both knees in quick succession. Crouching low, she swiped her blade across both of the soldiers' ankles from the back, the impossibly sharp edge parting the leather of the boot like butter and severing both Achilles' tendons. As the cyborg fell, she came to her feet, ripped the helmet off the cyber soldier's head, and cut her throat just as easily as she had her heels. As it always did in battle, minutes bled into hours. The sound of the fight was punctuated by the hiss of cryo lines being hit, grunts of pain, and the occasional sob from the scientists who had pulled the bed on its side and were hiding behind it in their cell. It was objectively beautiful. With Raptor back, they were faster and more efficient than ever. Every once in a while, 
he could sense the nanosecond of a hitch where Cypher's part would have been played, but it was almost gone. Enough time had almost passed. Seven of the Volga cyborgs were dead, and Raptor was grappling with one of the remaining two when something went wrong. One of the soldiers growled something to the other in Russian, and the one fighting Raptor stopped trying to survive. The scientists, Hawkeye tried to say, but the soldier was already there. He had planted a kick into one of Raptor's knees and made the deadly mistake of giving the second in command his back, sprinting into the isolation cell while Raptor covered it in a split second. By the time Raptor had the bar of his arm around the cyborg's neck, the soldier had thrown the bed aside, revealed the huddled, desperate scientists, and unloaded an entire magazine into the helpless group. Raptor broke the man's neck with a sickening snap. Tempest moved in to engage the last soldier, but her opponent banked to the right and made a rush for Jester, who had the slowest firing gun of the group. He took Jester to the ground, his hands on his shoulders. Tempest and Raptor were running, but they were all temporarily blinded as Jester activated the breech torch he had pulled from his belt and stabbed upwards digging into the soldier's eye and pushing up with all of his strength. It sizzled audibly, melted the man's eyeball, burned through his skull, and boiled the brain within before the soldier slumped over, dead. None of the Volga cyborgs had ever screamed in pain until Jester's kill. The small part of Sentinel that still felt anything shuddered. Then it was silent. It was done. Fucking hell. Jester grunted, throwing the dead cyber soldier off of him and standing up. Agreed, Sentinel said, deadpan. One more level to go. It took Hawkeye too long for Sentinel's taste to break into the system enough to find the hidden door that blended flawlessly into the laboratory wall. Inside was another set of elevators and stairs, and zero indication of what would be below. Here, yeah, Aegis held out her hand, discreetly passing two pain relief capsules to Jester. That's the second time you've been hit today. He gave her a withering look, but took the pills, briefly pulling up his mask and cramming them into his mouth. Maybe I'm a lover, not a fighter. Then you might be in the wrong career field, she chuckled, following Raptors back into the dark stairwell. Chester followed behind her, then Hawkeye and Tempest behind him. Sentinel led. Maybe they're hiring in the escort division of Umbral, he quipped, and she was ashamed that she gave him the satisfaction of asking. Wait, they have... Ugh, oh, fuck off, Chester. His laugh was quiet and amused. Beneath her mask, she was grinning, but she'd never let him know. She paused at the end of the stairwell, while Sentinel and Raptor went into the bottom level to scan the place for danger, but they returned quickly enough. The commander sounded cautious when he told them, I think there's someone down here, but just one person. Slowly, they spread out through the first room of the second level basement. The first thing she noticed was the light was no longer clinical white, but a warmer, buttery yellow. She recognized them immediately. These are sun lamps for vitamin D deficiency. It made sense when they turned the corner and entered into what she thought was another laboratory. It was a lab, but a very small one. Beyond that, what she saw stole her breath away. Past the lab were living quarters. The walls painted a muted shade of blue. The ambient lighting cast gentle shadows over a strangely small workplace adorned with holographic displays and educational consoles. There was a small kitchen tucked into one corner and a bookshelf in the other. Then. There were the three modular sleeping pods, 
cocoons that could be closed off to minimize stimuli when needed. The center one was open, soft music playing from overhead speakers meant to comfort the occupant. In the center of the sleeping pod was the child. Somewhere between five and seven, the child's head was shaved, and they were focused in on a small tablet clutched in their hands. Dressed in a white jumpsuit, the kid only looked up once the entire team was finally inside the entryway of the living quarters, a stunned silence hanging over all of them. No one said anything, but Aja slowly clipped her rifle to her back and pulled her mask off her face. The kid watched her with huge, wide blue eyes. Their eyebrows were so pale they might as well have been non-existent, but their skin was a smooth olive brown. There was no fear in them, just bored curiosity. Permission to approach? Aegis asked quietly. Granted, Sentinel responded. Aegis moved slowly, holding her empty hands up the entire time to appear as non-threatening as possible. The child watched her, but didn't move. When she was eight or so feet away, the child spoke. There's blood on you. Yes, she confirmed. There is. But I'm not hurt. Are you hurt? The child shook their head. No, but all my teachers are dead. The scientists upstairs that the cyborgs had assassinated. How do you know that? They shrugged one thin shoulder. I just know things sometimes. I could feel them die, but it didn't hurt me or scare me. I don't get scared. She forced a small smile. That's good. What's your name? The child regarded Aegis for a long moment before responding. Jen. But my long name is Genesis. Female. Designation 28. Aegis mulled that over. 28, huh? Is there more of you, Jen? Jen shook her head. No. My brother and sister were Gen 27 and 29. But they aren't here anymore. It's just me. The teachers burned them when they started to get sick. Aegis' stomach churned, bile climbing up her throat. The horrible truth that Volga had euthanized and cremated 28 other of these... these Genesis children made her want to vomit. But she pushed it away, feeling the eyes of the rest of Ares on her. Why are you here, Jen? Because of this? Jen held her hands up, and the tablet she was holding floated through the air to Aegis, who took it into her grasp, hiding her awe. She heard Tempest inhale sharply behind her. And this... Jen's eyes went unfocused, and Aegis felt the lightest brush of something against her mind. Alicia Alvarez, medic, 29 years old. Stop! Aegis shook her head hard, and Jen blinked, her eyes clearing. That's... that's enough. Thank you for showing me. Jen held her hands up again, and Aegis felt the tablet in her hands pull away floating back to the child, who went back to whatever she was doing before Ares arrived. Shaken to her core, Aegis turned and walked back to the rest of the team, making a beeline for Sentinel. She's Project Genesis, Sentinel confirmed. Go ahead and trank her, Aegis, and we'll call for extraction. Whatever she had been about to say died in her throat and she looked up at her commander in cold, visceral distress. Sentinel, we can't take her back to Umbral. Something flashed in his eyes. Sympathy? Those are our orders. She's a child, Aegis hissed, hands balling into fists. There is no world 
for Umbral doesn't dissect her piece by piece so they can make their own. You saved those kids in Haven, those normal, unremarkable children? We both know that's different. Raptor cursed under his breath and pushed past the two of them. We don't have time for this. If the two of you are going to bicker like an old married couple, I guess I'll be the one to do my fucking job. She felt panic hit her like a bolt of electricity. This was not the same man she tried so hard to save. The truth of it was there, and the vitriol of his words to her. Raptor, wait! She ignored Sentinel calling her back and chased him, reaching her hand out for Raptor's shoulder. When she heard the unmistakable sound of Hawkeye clicking the safety off his sidearm. She and Raptor both froze, turning, to see the sniper aiming his Glock at Aegis, looking so casual about it she almost laughed. He said nothing, and gave no explanation, but she could feel the red dot of his sights so clearly above her heart that it was almost tangible. Even Raptor seemed shocked but he recovered in an instant, telling her without looking at her. We have our orders. Hawkeye, stand down, Sentinel barked. Commander, the sniper started. Stand down, or I'll put you down. Then he added, Same for you, Raptor. Get back here. Now. Hawkeye looked between Aegis and Sentinel, and without another word holstered the gun. Throughout it all, Jen watched everything with her owlish eyes. If anyone steps a single toe out of line again, there will be hell to pay, the commander said once they all settled. We're going to call for extraction, and it will be here in 30 minutes. We are finishing this mission, and what just occurred will never be spoken of outside of this team. Do you understand? Everyone agreed, except Aegis, who kept her mouth shut in a thin line. Sentinel turned to her. Do you understand, Aegis? Her jaw worked, but she couldn't stay silent. They can't do this. What you mean, the commander told her, low and dangerous, is that you can't do it. I won't do it. Her mind raced with ways out of this. Ways that she wouldn't have to hand the little girl behind her over to the team of butchers back at base. I... I still have contacts from Radiant Mercy. Let me take her, Sentinel. I can take one of the motor slids we saw in the garage and take her to that little town near the coast and... I could kill you, he breathed yanking off his mask so she could see his cold, expressionless face. You're asking me to go against orders. Steal from Umbral. I know, she snapped. Article 1, Section 3. In case of insubordination, disobedience, or failure to comply with orders, the offending team member is subject to disciplinary action at the leader's discretion, including immediate execution. We all signed the same contract. She tilted her head to the side. So do it. Or let me take her. He didn't break eye contact with her, his hand hovering over his sidearm, the vein in his forehead pulsing visibly. Behind him, she could see the shapes of Raptor and Hawkeye, like reapers. But she never looked away from Sentinel. She had to believe in him, had to believe that he was the leader she thought he was. Aegis wondered if he, too, was thinking about sitting in the dark, eating omelets in a quiet moment of peace. The tension climbed in the silence between them, but then footsteps, small and deadly. Tempest came to Aegis's side her stubborn chin tilted up and fury in her gaze. You'll have to put me down too. She could barely breathe for the emotion of it. Emotion she couldn't let show on her face. Aegis wasn't alone. 
when Jester silently came to the other side of her, and she felt his heavy hand on her shoulder. She bit the inside of her cheek until it bled, to keep her expression neutral. Redness crawled up Sentinel's neck, blood heating with the power of his anger. Look at what you've done. Aegis felt no fear then. If I let you do this, he hissed, if I let you take her, nothing will ever be the same. You understand that, right? Our lives don't belong to us. Umbral will find out. They will disband the team at best, and execute all of us at worst. You already know what to do, Sentinel. She took a wild chance and raised her hand, grabbing his arm as if to say, You're human. We're human. Sentinel's own arm shot up, his hand open, and she was sure he was going to grab her throat. But she should have known better. He had better control than that. Sentinel's hand switched courses, and he raked in through his short hair. You damn us all. I would, she agreed. His eyes moved to Tempest and then Jester. And the two of you? Yes, Tempest said. Jester hesitated longer, but nodded. Once. Raptor knew what was about to happen before Aegis did. You've got to be fucking kidding me. Request to take the child to safety, Aegis asked. Sentinel closed his eyes, and she knew that he would never forgive her. Granted. Hawkeye shot forward, but Tempest was there, her hands fisted in his shirt and shoving him back until he stumbled. Her pistol was out before he caught himself, but she didn't point it. Stand down, comrade. Hawkeye was silent, like he always was, but his eyes narrowed. It was done. She had won. It might have cost Aegis everything, but she wouldn't know for sure until later. But at that moment, there was work to be done. I'll call for extraction. And when it gets here, I'll tell them that you and... I'll go, Tempest offered. Sentinel continued. I'll tell them that you and Tempest are in pursuit of Project Genesis. I won't contact you, so when it's done, you contact me instead and let me know that you failed in capturing Genesis. I'll have someone sent for the two of you. I won't cover for you besides that, Aegis. If Umbral catches you and kills you both, then so be it. This is all I will give you. It's enough. She promised, hating the defeat she heard in his voice. Thank you, Sentinel. Don't fucking thank me. He had to force the words through his teeth. You can tell me when you're done, but otherwise, I don't want to hear a word from you, Aegis. Not when you forced this on me. He swept past her, Raptor and Hawkeye following. It was the most hollow victory of her life. Aegis pulled her mask back on, and Tempest moved with her like a shadow. Jester lingered long enough to tell her, in a quiet voice, You better be fucking right about this, Aegis. There was no humor in his voice. He was just resigned. Am I allowed to thank you? Yeah. For every day of the rest of our lives. You know, you act like you were torn. But I knew the entire times that you were with me, even before you moved. Jester watched her, but said nothing as she continued. You are a better man than you think you are. Jester jerked his head towards the retreating commander. And him? She closed her eyes and exhaled slowly. Yeah. Jester clapped her on the shoulder one more time and left her following the other three men back up the first floor. She sighed and turned to gather Jen. I'm assuming you're smart enough to understand what's going on. 
Jen nodded and walked wordlessly to her wardrobe and began to lay her up. The little girl struggled to lace up her snow boots, and Aegis watched as Tempest knelt to help her tie them, her heart in her throat. She made the right call. She had to believe that. Otherwise, the hesitation would kill her and Tempest both. They departed, hugging the glacier in their snowmobiles. Twenty minutes before they saw the lights of the Umbral Chopper coming in to get the rest of the team, Aegis had the kid with her, tucked close into her body and wrapped in every blanket they could carry. Tempest brought up the rear and kept watch. They moved with no lights on, depending on the moon, and eventually the green, blue light of the Aurora Borealis. When they had first walked outside, Genesis had told Aegis, mouth open and gaping at the moon, I've never been outside before. It was then that Tempest knew she hadn't fucked up following Aegis. She was still a person, damn it. It didn't make her weak for wanting to save a kid. It made her human. The two women and their little girl flew through the night for three hours before they finally had to stop, heating canteen water for Genesis to sip to warm her from the inside out. While the girl drank, Tempest leaned on the snowmobile beside Aegis and blew out a slow breath. It curled lazily into the dark sky above them. I have to make a confession, she said. I definitely came with you to save the kid. But I had an ulterior motive, too. Aegis, blowing into her gloved hands for warmth, just waited for her to continue. I don't know who else to trust, but when you stood up to Sentinel, I knew you were someone I could. They were alone, but Tempest lowered her voice anyway. Alicia, this is going to sound insane, but I have to talk to you about Hawkeye. It had been over 24 hours since Tempest had slept, and the energy tablets were bitter and dry under her tongue. She and Aegis abandoned the stolen snowmobiles under an icy overhang, walking the rest of the way to the tiny fishing village on the coast. They took turns carrying the kid the last mile on foot, and the girl was bird-boned and light. In the washed-out gloom of the cloud-covered midnight sun, they saw the bright halogens and red warning lights of the coastal town before any other structures became apparent. Tempest adjusted her mask and kept going. Everything was colder near the water, and while she and Aegis were dressed in heated bodysuits courtesy of Umbral, Genesis was shivering hard against them, teeth chattering under a cocoon of blankets. She had grown quickly weary of her new outdoor adventure and had asked multiple times to go back to her basement bunker. It was only after Tempest snapped out an annoyed reminder to the little girl that if she went back, she'd probably end up as ashes like the rest of her siblings, that Genesis ceased her complaining. But if they didn't get the kid warmed up, it wouldn't matter. She'd be dead either way. Before they had left the laboratory, Aegis had used the internal system, bypassing her own Umbral-made tech, to make contact with a small number of allies she still had at Radiant Mercy Medical Corps. Begging a favor, she asked them to send someone to take the kid. Listening in, it was then that Tempest learned Aegis had been skimming off the top of some of Umbral's own medical shipments and passing them off to her old colleagues. Taking Genesis would be the repayment for all that dangerous work. They had been traveling for hours, but had hours still until they would be able to rendezvous with Aegis's contact. So, they had to find a way to pass the time without the kid freezing to death. The closer they got to town, the more the main export of the place became apparent. It stank of fish and brine, and the deep, 
Honking bays of the local seal population echoed off the icy cliff faces. Genesis wrinkled her nose at the smell. In the near dark, Tempest made her way carefully down one slippery dock and boarded a small fishing boat, tilted to one side and seemingly abandoned. Within minutes, she exited once more, her arms full of weathered oilskin coats. They hadn't spoken since their talk at the halfway point, but as the women shrugged on the coats over their obvious mercenary kits, wrapping Genesis in the third, Aegis laid out the plan. They just need to lay low until Sean gets here, she explained, buttoning the old gray coat to her neck. He told me that there is a small diner near the marina, and that he would call in and pay for us to eat and wait there. That feels too easy, Tempest commented, taking her helmet off and, after a moment's consideration, stomping on it until the interface shattered before throwing it into the dark ocean where it sank. There was no audio or visual feed to Umbral, when the mission involved rival megacorporations or other entities. They feared someone might be able to hack into the wireless connection, and from there, the Umbral system as a whole. But even disconnected from their home base, the helmets looked futuristic and otherworldly, not something she would have been able to pass off as normal. How is he going to explain two women and a bald kid walking off the glacier and into a town with, what, 50 people total in it? We aren't exactly inconspicuous. What other choice do we have? This was your idea, remember? I'm trusting you, Aegis. Since that's what I'm asking you to do. Trust me. Look, let's go before this kid goes hypothermic, and all of this was for nothing. They both made the tentative decision to uncover their hair and faces fully, agreeing that going in masked would rouse more suspicion than not. The air was painful on her skin, immediately making it feel dry and chapped, but they didn't have much further to go. For the kid, they tugged a beanie, also pilfered from the listing boat, over the peach fuzz on her head. It was early and while there were a few fishermen tottering around the docks, the place was mostly empty. Of course, they all looked at the trio, but no one said anything. The diner wasn't hard to find, being the hub of the marina, and the only building with smoke curling from a spindly metal chimney. The soldiers adjusted their coats one more time to make sure they covered as much of their gear-laden bodies as possible placed the shivering Genesis onto her feet, and entered the diner like any other paying customer. A stout man behind the counter took one look at them and nodded once. In stilted English, he said, Kiss you the three I'm supposed to be expecting. Here, take a seat. Inside, it was warm enough that the kids sighed in obvious relief, but Tempest knew she'd be sweating under her layers soon enough. It was a modest-sized restaurant, with cracked vinyl booths and a bar top with round, equally cracked stools. They took a booth overlooking the marina, Genesis tucked in Aegis's side like a parasite. It wasn't where she had expected to be after the mission, but life with Umbral rarely let her go off script, so at least it was something different. The stout man approached the table with three mugs, plopping them down unceremoniously before glancing at Genesis and taking one back. He soon returned with a different mug on a saucer dish, placing it in front of the kid and walking away. Tempest took a mouthful of the black coffee, almost as bitter as the energy pills from earlier. Aegis did the same, pulling her white gloves off with her teeth and sighing in pleasure as she wrapped her bare, cold reddened hands around the chipped ceramic cup. Genesis who had been gifted a mug of hot chocolate instead, was drinking it with exhausted abandon, her eyes half closed. So, Aegis started. Talk. Tempest looked around, taking in the weary elderly man on the corner bar stool, and sighed. Is this private enough? Let's be real. 
This is the most privacy either of us have gotten in years. She looked out the frosted window, brows drawn together. This might be the first place we've been if we haven't been constantly monitored. Fair enough. Tempest took another long drink, tapping her short, blunt fingernails on the cup when she was finished. I put my neck out to do this for you, Aegis. She gestured towards the kid. So, be honest with me. Do you have any loyalties to Hawkeye outside of the team? Do you know him well? Do you trust him? The medic thinned her lips. Next to her, the napkin holder began to shiver on its own before Aegis slapped a hand on top of it, pulling a few out and handing them to Genesis with a hissed, Don't do that here, before giving her attention back to Tempest. Loyalty? Just the loyalty to the team, nothing more. He's, well, not very personable, but I've never had an issue with him. I'd fight alongside him like I would any of you, and I guess I would trust him if on a mission I had to rely on him. But outside of the Eclipse Initiative? She shook her head. I have no feeling one way or the other. Except, except after today, right? Tempest finished for her. When he pointed his gun at you, it was unexpected, the medic agreed. Everyone was pissed, I know, but his reaction was so extreme that it caught me off guard. Do you think he would have taken the shot? Tempest clinked her nails against the cup again, burning off nervous energy. If he was anyone else on the team, I'd say no. It was understood between the members of Ares, as well as all of the other Eclipse Initiative teams, that their commander was the stand-in for Umbral. Answering to Umbral meant answering to Sentinel in the field, without question, without hesitation. So the idea that one of them might act of their own accord was hard to fathom. But then again, Tempest thought, Aegis taking the kid was no different than Hawkeye pointing the sidearm. She might have gotten an affirmative from Sentinel first, but she had forced the commander's hand. Still, it was hard for her to not look at it with at least a little bit of emotion instead of taking it completely literally. Both Hawkeye and Aegis defied Sentinel, but one for death and the other for life. Explain, Aegis prompted. Tempest blew out a slow breath. <sighs> I get the feeling that Sentinel is the commander of Ares, but maybe not the commander of Hawkeye, you know? What if he reports to someone else? We know they messed with his brain after Cypher died. That computer-to-brain interface or whatever, but why? We're the only team operating a member short right now. Everyone else has a tech guy and a sniper. You know they've got some brainiacs down in the lower divisions itching to be promoted. You're saying a lot, Aegis pointed out, but not making any points. I'm getting around to it, Tempest snapped. Look, we've run into some weird shit. I wouldn't believe that anything, she waved her fingers in the air. Spooky was going on if we hadn't all seen it with our own two eyes. Hell, the kid is proof enough that we don't understand everything. And what's more, that Umbral doesn't tell us shit. The kid in question had finished her hot chocolate and was snoozing, warm and full, against the medic. Aegis, though, was giving her full attention to the other soldier, waiting for her to continue. Okay, so, what I'm trying to get at is, I think a Hawkeye is a plant, or at least getting commands from above Sentinel's head. And that's why they didn't want to replace Cypher with someone else. Because maybe Cypher was too close to figuring out Hawkeye's secret. And Umbral didn't want to risk it. Aegis went pale, leaning forward and lowering her voice. Are you insinuating that Cypher's death never sat right with me? Yeah. 
Tempest swallowed hard and looked out the window, trying to collect her thoughts into something understandable. Hawkeye was with him when he died. Hawkeye replaced him. Hawkeye was the first guinea pig for the brain interface that Cypher had been working on. His mark is on everything that Cypher left behind. Cypher might have been taken out like Hawkeye said, but even then he's the least likely person on the team to have taken over for him. If it was anyone, I would have picked Jester. Umbral picked Hawkeye for a reason. There was a long pause, filled with the hum of the dishwasher in the back of the restaurant and the lazy lapping of the waves against the dock outside. Have you sought this the entire time since Cypher died? I was frustrated with Hawkeye not being able to Cypher's shoes, sure. But during Spire, Tempest was stiff, and when she planted her palms on the table, it was to stop the shaking of her hands. Aegis. Hawkeye cursed in Russian. Off the cuff, under his breath in Russian. I know I sound insane, but... I don't know. It made no sense, and... It reminded me so much of Cypher. And when I confronted him, he played dumb, but didn't outright deny it. It was after that that I started to try and piece stuff together. I wanted to have a clearer picture for you when I told you all of this, but I couldn't pass up this opportunity. Even without the Russian thing, I think Hawkeye is a threat to us, and we don't even know it. I think he's a threat to Sentinel. And I've just made his position even Vika. Aegis looked ill, pressing the heel of her palm to her forehead. I defied Sentinel in front of the whole team, and potentially in front of Umbral's mole. So you believe me? Tempest sounded like she didn't quite believe it would be so easy. If he hadn't had drawn on me today, I wouldn't, but he did. So I'm open to the idea that there is more to his objectives than meets the eye. Unfortunately for you, I am no longer in anyone's good graces, so I don't think that Sentinel would listen to me if I brought this to him. I don't need you to do that anyway. I just wanted to have another pair of eyes on the situation. If I'm being completely honest, Raptor would have been my first choice, but we both saw how he's different. Aegis finished for Tempest, a halo of sadness falling over her. Yeah, he is. As much as I hate to bear this burden with you, you made the right call. And then, to add a little levity to something that was otherwise unbearably heavy, she added, Rookie. Tempest snorted and finished the rest of her coffee. It was awful, but when the cook came by with the pot... Both women accepted another cup. They also accepted the three bowls of buckwheat porridge that were dropped off at the table, hot and with butter melting on the top. It settled the adrenaline and caffeine storm in her stomach, even if it was like paste once it cooled. Discreetly, Aegis pulled up her coat enough to see her wrist in her face. My contacts should be here in the next 15 minutes. So, what do we do? Not about the kid, but everything else. There's nothing we can really do besides stay vigilant. If you're wrong, and we make a fuss, we'll be off the team and demoted before we can take a breath. If you're right, then we might end up like Cypher. If we can definitively prove something is wrong, then one of us will have to go to Sentinel. There's nothing else to be done. Tempest didn't say anything, but in her mind she knew that if she ever had definitive proof that Hawkeye had killed Cypher, she'd kill the sniper with her bare hands, consequences be damned. Umbral couldn't put her on a team, drill it into her that the team was an extension of herself, and then expect that she'd just roll over like an obedient dog when one of her teammates was murdered. It wouldn't be easy. But Tempest was iron. She wouldn't fail. She hadn't always been iron, though. And that is why she risked everything to help Aegis get the kid out. 
because she too had once been bird-boned and hollow, tethered to a hospital bed, forgetting day by day what shade of blue the sky was. They watched the small covered red and white boat pull in among the others, and the fishermen on the docks helped tie it in place before the sailor climbed out. He was massive, with copper red hair and a matching beard. Aegis sat up straighter in recognition, turning to Tempest and telling her to go ahead and call for extraction from the rest of Ares. Tempest didn't know how to tell the little girl goodbye, not that it bothered her to see her go. It was a relief, really, to cross her arms and lean against the building as Aegis handed Genesis off. The medic lowered herself to eye level with the kid, giving her a small hug and assuring her that the man who had come to retrieve her was safe. The boat was untied and pulled away from the dock, cutting a clean path through the water and ice as it turned towards its destination. First, Svalbard, where the whole mess with Hawkeye had begun, and from there, somewhere in Scandinavia. It was fitting, like the closing of a book. But as the sound of helicopter blades cut through the air, thrumming with the promise of a return to both Ares and Umbral, Tempest didn't feel like any books were closing. Instead, it felt like a long, drawn-out beginning. She told herself she wasn't afraid. But when it was Hawkeye who jerked the helicopter door open to let her in, she felt it anyway. A white, icy, hot thread of fear. But there was rage inside of her too. And before any fear could sink in, it was burned away.